Grievous' starfighter was still there, as were the remains of Grievous. Apparently, not even the local rock vultures could stomach him. Tan T-4 swept through the Kashyyyk system on silent running. This was still a combat zone. Captain Antilles wouldn't even risk standard scans, because they could so easily be detected and backtraced by Separatist forces. And the Separatists weren't the only ones Antilles was worried about. There's a signal again, sir. Whoops. Wait, I'll get it back. Antilles fiddled some more with the controls on the beacon. Blasted thing, he muttered. What, you can't calibrate it without using the force? Bale stared through the forward view wall. Kashyyyk was only a tiny green disk, 200,000 kilometers away. Do you have a vector? Roughly, sir. It seems to be on an orbital tangent headed out system. I think we can risk a scan. Tight beam. Very well, sir. Antilles gave the necessary orders, and moments later, the scan tech reported that the object they'd picked up seemed to be some sort of escape pod. It's not a Republic model, sir. Wait, here comes the database. The scan tech frowned at its screen. It's Wookiee, sir. That doesn't make any sense. Why would a Wookiee escape pod be outbound from Kashyyyk? Interesting. Bale didn't yet allow himself to hope. Life signs? Yes. Well, maybe. This reading doesn't make any... The scan tech could only shrug. I'm not sure, sir. Whatever it is, it's no Wookiee, that's for sure. For the first time all day, Bale Organa allowed himself to smile. Captain Antilles? The captain saluted crisply. On our way, sir. Obi-Wan took General Grievous' starfighter screaming out of the atmosphere so fast, he popped the gravity well and made jump before the Vigilance could even scramble its fighters. He reverted to real space well beyond the system, kicked the starfighter to a new vector, and jumped again. A few more jumps of random direction and duration left him deep in interstellar space. You know, he said to himself, integral hyperspace capability is rather useful in a starfighter. Why don't we have it yet? While the starfighter's nav system whirred and chunked its way through recalculating his position, he punched codes to gang his Jedi comlink into the starfighter's system. Instead of a hollow scan, the comlink generated an audio signal, an accelerating series of beeps. Obi-Wan knew that signal. Every Jedi did. It was the recall code. It was being broadcast on every channel by every holonet repeater. It was supposed to mean that the war was over. It was supposed to mean that the Council had ordered all Jedi to return to the temple immediately. Obi-Wan suspected it actually meant what had happened on Utapau was far from an isolated incident. He keyed the comm link for audio. He took a deep breath. Emergency code 913, he said and waited. The starfighter's comm system cycled through every response frequency. He waited some more. Emergency code 913. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Repeat. Emergency code 913. Are there any Jedi out there? He waited. His heart thumped heavily. Any Jedi, please respond. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi declaring a 913 emergency. He tried to ignore the small, still voice inside his head that whispered he might just be the only one out here. He might just be the only one, period. He started punching coordinates for a single jump that would bring him close enough to pick up a signal directly from Coruscant, when a burst of fuzz came over his comlink. A quick glance confirmed the frequency. A Jedi channel. Please repeat, Obi-Wan said. I'm locking onto your signal. Please repeat. The fuzz became a spray of blue laser, which gradually resolved into a fuzzy figure of a tall, slim human with dark hair and an elegant goatee. Master Kenobi, are you all right? Have you been wounded? Senator Organa, Obi-Wan exclaimed with profound relief. No, I'm not wounded, but I'm certainly not all right. I need help. 
My clones turned on me. I barely escaped with my life. There have been ambushes all over the galaxy. Obi-Wan lowered his head, offering a silent wish to the Force that the victims might find peace within it. Have you had contact with any other survivors? Only one, the Alderanian senator said grimly. Lock onto my coordinates. He's waiting for you. A curve of knuckle, skinned black scab, corrugated with dirt and leaking red. The fringe of fray at the cuff of a beige sleeve, dark, crusted with splatter from the death of a general. The tawny swirl of grain and wine-dark tabletop of polished Alderanian crin. These were what Obi-Wan Kenobi could look at without starting to shake. The walls of the small conference room on Tanti 4 were too featureless to hold his attention. To look at a wall allowed his mind to wander, and the shaking began. The shaking got worse when he met the ancient green stare of the tiny alien seated across the table from him, for that wrinkled leather skin and those tufts of withered hair were his earliest memory, and they reminded Obi-Wan of the friends who had died today. The shaking got worse still when he turned to the other being in the room, because he wore politician's robes that reminded Obi-Wan of the enemy who yet lived. The deception. The death of Jedi masters he had admired, of Jedi knights who had been his friends. The death of his oath to Qui-Gon. The death of Anakin. Anakin must have fallen along with Mace and Asian, Saisi and Kit. Fallen along with the temple, along with the order itself. Ashes. Ashes and dust. Twenty-five thousand years wiped from existence in a single day. All the dreams, all the promises, all the children. We took them from their homes. Obi-Wan fought to stay in his chair. The pain inside him demanded motion. It became wave after wave of tremors. We promised their families. Control yourself, you must. Still Jedi you are. Yes, Master Yoda. That scab on his knuckle. Focused on that, he could suppress the shaking. Yes, we are Jedi. But what if we're the last? If the last we are, unchanged our duty is. Yoda settled his chin onto hands folded over the head of his gimmer stick. He looked every day of his nearly 900 years. While one Jedi lives, survive the Order does. Resist the darkness with every breath we must. He lifted his head and the stick angled to poke Obi-Wan in the shin. Especially the darkness in ourselves, young one. Of the dark side, despair is. The simple truth of this called to him. Even despair is attachment. It is a grip clenched upon pain. Slowly, very slowly, Obi-Wan Kenobi remembered what it was to be a Jedi. He leaned back in his chair and covered his face with both hands, inhaling a thin stream of air between his palms. Into himself with the air, he brought pain and guilt and remorse, and as he exhaled, they trailed away and vanished in the air. He breathed out his whole life. Everything he had done, everything he had been, friends and enemies, dreams and hopes and fears empty, he found clarity. Scrubbed clean, the force shone through him. He sat up and nodded to Yoda. Yes, he said. We may be the last, but what if we're not? Green leather brows drew together over lambent eyes. The temple beacon. Yes. Any surviving Jedi might still obey the recall and be killed. Bail Organa looked from one Jedi to the other, frowning. What are you saying? I'm saying, Obi-Wan replied, that we have to go back to Coruscant. It's too dangerous, the senator said instantly. The whole planet is a trap. Yes, we have a... Ah! <gasps> the loss of Anakin stabbed him. Then, he let that go too. I have, he corrected himself. A policy 
on traps.